consistent self-improvement everybody you are now listening to american gypsy podcast i'm your host classic and i'm here with my co-host gypsy and today we have don gatewood you might remember him from episode four, um, 49 he is a co-founder of um, and ceo of the initiative baltimore a professional leadership consultant and host of the podcast leadership and professional development with Don Gatewood. Welcome back, Don. Welcome back. Thank you Don. so much. I'm so excited to be here because I know we got warmed up in the first conversation and there was a few things that we needed to keep on going and keep on talking about. So I'm happy to continue on our discussion. Yeah, yeah I know we, back. we started with um, nonprofits last time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, which is something you also focus on. Um, mm -hmm. Today, we're going to focus on professional development because absolutely that's one of the topics you focus on on your podcast as well as you do um, leadership uh, I mean sorry uh, business coaching and right like that so how did you get into that or can you tell us a little bit about that absolutely so I of course most of my professional experience has been in a nonprofit world so that's where my nonprofit background comes from and you know I've you know my education has been centered in that area as well however, as a professional in the nonprofit world, the area of focus for me has always been workforce development. So I have always worked with, or not always, but a great deal of my professional years, I've worked with people who were looking to get back into the workforce, but maybe they had some type of barrier. It could have been people coming out of prison, maybe been gone for prison for 10, 15 years. I've worked with people who were living with homelessness or people who maybe never had a lot of workforce experience, um, maybe were young. And so I've had a chance to work with different populations in Detroit, which is where I'm from, but also in Washington DC area, which I currently am in right now. I've been really, really blessed to work with a lot of different populations of people who wanna do well, who have families, who have big dreams and aspirations, but maybe don't have all of the skills and the information as to how to go about being successful professionally. And so that's where I've stepped in by being able to develop programs, manage programs, teach curriculums, all regarding finding a job, keeping a job, conflict resolution, interviewing resumes, and the list goes on and on, negotiating salaries, you name it, that's what we've dealt with over the years because people need that information in order to be successful in the workforce. And that's what I've been lucky enough to do um, inside the nonprofit space for, like I say, over 20 years. And so I just decided that, hey, why not continue doing this, but not just with my nine to five, but also for myself. And so I decided to create um, a pathway for me to work with people uh, who need these skills, whether they're young folks coming out of college, whether they're more seasoned people who are looking for career changes, or even if it's young folks who are in high school and really are starting their whole professional journey at the age of 15 and 16, it's never too early and it's never too late to learn how to be successful with employment and employment rate. And so that's how I came to be and that's how I've continued on the journey. You mentioned earlier helping people with, um, that came out of prison or homelessness, um, which would kind of be the similar challenges you would have when you're creating like a resume or getting back into the workforce as someone who's also had a gap in employment. Um, so how, I guess, what are some tips that you'd have in I guess developing a new, it's not necessarily a new resume, but either had a gap in employment or um, career change and you're developing somewhat of a new resume. What are some challenges and tips? Absolutely. For example, like for mine, I'm changing from music career and now I'm doing podcasting and I just tried to do up a podcast resume to see. You know, right. Uh, it's completely switch, yeah. Absolutely. So that's one of those amazing things about professional growth and journey. We all may hit those moments where we say, man, I've been a teacher for 10 years, but I want to do something different. Or we may have a moment where someone we went away, they were in jail or prison for five years. And it's like, whoa, I'm back into the workforce. 
and you know now I need to you know start over or there are so many different reasons why people feel like it's almost like starting over or starting again or just getting started all together mm-hmm. and one thing that I would say to a person is number one remember this the main goal of the resume is of course to get to get the interview the interviewer is going to look at the resume to determine if they feel you're worthy to get the interview so that's the goal so there's a number of things that we want to do with the resume first and foremost it needs to be it needs to be grammatically correct and it needs to really speak to who you are your education background your work experience background and really just the impact that you have had as a human being Uh, Every employer is looking to determine the best they can based off what's written is, will this person be, you know, consistent or can they, can I see them fitting into the position? And they're making this determination off of just a couple of words. So that's a really tall order. When you think about it, they don't know you, they've never seen you. They're just making a determination, a guesstimation off of what's on a piece of paper. So what I would always say to a person is this, to remember that number one, the average person, when they're looking at your resume, they may look at it for like 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and make a determination very quickly if they think you'll be a good fit. So I would always say to a person that, A, if you're doing a resume, you need to be sure as to what type of position that you are thinking about going into. So regardless if you've taken a break or you haven't worked in a while, now that you've decided that it's time for me to get back into the workforce or to go down this particular arena, you wanna be clear on what that arena is. So if you're going into customer service, that's important because now we know if your goal is to get into a customer service position, then we need to make sure that the resume speaks to that particular arena because customer service would be very different than education because education may require different skill sets and different abilities than customer service which would be very different than doing construction work so again whatever your interest is wherever you are trying to go you want to make sure you're clear on that because your resume should be reflective of the area that you're trying to go in so once you're clear on where you're trying to go you need to then think about what experience and what education do I have that will demonstrate that I can do this, I'm good in this position, I have the skill set. And once we begin to think about our education and our experience, we will begin to create the resume around those experiences that will help show that you're qualified for the area that you're trying to go into. But what a lot of us may find out is that maybe we don't have all of the skills and experience that we would like to have to make us look strong. And that's where we have to get super creative. There are so many different places where you to volunteer. There are so many different classes that you can take, online classes that are free. There are online seminars that are free. There are classes at the community college. There are agencies that are looking for volunteers. And so these are all ways that you can build up your strength and your experience because you may not have it, but by volunteering at an agency that focus on that area, you can get that. And some people are like, well, I don't want to volunteer because I don't get paid for it. I only want to do things that I'm going to get paid for. Let me stop you right there. If the goal is to get the experience that you need so that you can long term be successful in the field you want to go in, you may have to take some time to volunteer to get that experience so that it can go on your resume and therefore you can look stronger. And that's the same with taking classes. We are in such a great time now because we have online classes that they offer for free. Universities offer all types of classes for free and even give you certificates. Every university that you go on, they have an area where they offer classes for free that can help strengthen your skill set and make you look stronger on your resume. So that's one of the major things that I would ask for anyone to do. Number one, be clear on the area that you're trying to go in. And then number two, recognize what skills you have that says that you're a good fit. But then three, if you realize that you can enhance, start looking at the options that you have to enhance your 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 experience and your strength so that you can develop a strong resume. 
I never thought of like I take a lot of online courses, but I never thought to put that on my resume. Like absolutely. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I've heard of volunteering. I just didn't think about online courses. So I might have to look into that. Absolutely, because you're developing skills from those classes. Yeah. Yeah. So when one of the things I struggle with when creating a resume is the cover letter. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's optional, but I wonder, like, is it, is it, how important is it from a, from the person deciding to hire someone? That's a really good question. And it's situational because it all depends on who is reviewing your resume or your credentials. For one man or woman who's reviewing it, they may believe that the cover letter is super important. And another person, they may not. See, here's the thing. We don't know who's on the other side of the computer. Once we submit that application and that resume, we don't know who's seeing it, whether it's an intern, whether it's a robot, whether it's an actual person or multiple people, we don't know. So I would always say to a person to just assume that all of the components that are traditional, whether it's a resume, a cover letter, the, the document that even shows your, you know, your, your letters of support, your references, just be prepared to submit all of those documents because it cannot hurt. Uh, the, again, there are people who really value those and they don't, but I would have you um, err on the side of caution and develop a strong cover letter, even if not every person who receives it will value it the same. When when you're giving references, say you had a gap in employment or you're kind of starting over mm -hmm. and, you know, references is something that's important to a lot of companies who and you might not have a say a coworker or a boss because it's been a such a long time maybe you don't want to use that what who are some I guess people you can use for references in your life absolutely and that's where we have to be you know creative because let's just take a, a step back to think about what the purpose of a reference is so when an employer is asking you to submit references, they are looking to develop a understanding of who you are and the type of person you are. And because they've never met you before, they're relying on those references to help tell a story so that they can create a picture of who you are in anticipation of how you might be if you're hired the position if you're offered the position and if you're hired. So it is supremely important that you have people who can speak to you, whether it's speak to your character, whether it's to speak to your, your personality type, whether it's to speak to your, your skill set, your ability, whether it's to speak to the type of strengths you have. And so there are a number of people who can speak to those qualities. So while an employer is qualified to speak to um, your, your skills. They're not the only person. So for example, again, I talked about earlier, if you volunteered, the people who you volunteered with and the agency that you volunteered with, they could speak to your personality type as well as how you get along with people because you're gonna to have to get along with people when you volunteer. When you work with people, for example, you may be a part of a committee. You may be, let's say, you may belong to Toastmasters uh, International, or you may be a part of a, a parent club where you are you know, volunteering with other parents, with your, your child in your school. But those people who are on that committee with you, they could speak to your character because you all have worked on projects before. They could speak to, you know, your passion and how you're passionate about the young folks. And so you have to really just think about your life. Maybe you belong to a, a bowling, a bowling league and you're the president of the bowling league where you organize that group, you put together events. So however you live your life and however you're involved, whether it's religion, whether it's 
you know, groups that you belong to, those individuals, they can speak to your character, your work ethic, and they can speak to the type of person you are. So those are the kind of folks that you want to be on your your reference sheet, people who can speak to all aspects of you. So that could include a teacher, that could include a, a coworker, someone who you um, are on a committee with. But we all sometimes don't think about folks who can speak to our character, but we have a lot. We just have to think about it and look beyond just the places where you've held a nine to five, because there are so many other people who can speak to the kind of person you are. And those are the folks that you want listed, those who you know, who will speak favorably and who can really speak in depth about the type of person you are, because they're going to sell you when the employer calls their words matter and the employer, they hang on to those words very closely. So I guess I, was um, gonna, I, I don't want to go right quite left field yet. So I'm gonna let you finish. <laughs> what, what did you have no, something no, no, in terms of? I was gonna get into like salary negotiation. But yeah, I wasn't that's fine. sure if you had something. Special. But you know what though? Actually, I want to just spend a little bit more time about those yeah. references because I started to think about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's the thing though about the references: when you're choosing people to be your reference, they need to be people who will answer the phone, who will mm -hmm. call back. They need to be people who are reliable, check their emails, because employers oftentimes won't move forward unless they hear from your reference. Mm -hmm. And if you choose someone who maybe they don't check their phone as often or they're not as reliable, that could really be a delay in the process. Mm -hmm. And if they have a short period of time, that could impact how quickly you're hired and if you're hired at all. Now, usually they'll call you and say, hey, we had a difficult time reaching one of your references. Can you give us another one? But you want to make sure before you put someone down that you know that they're going to be reliable and they're going to respond. And again, you want to make sure that these are people who are going to speak clear and well and can articulate um, exactly their experience. So it's important not to just pick someone, but to someone who's going to be reliable, who you know will be responding, who check their emails because references may call, they may also email. I've had it happen both ways. Mm -hmm. And um, it's important that you consider that as you're deciding who you're going to write down as your reference. I just wanted to add that part. Yeah. Do you feel like there's because I, I hate giving out numbers. Mm -hmm. So I like emails. Do you think there's, you know, a preference on the employer side? Right. I think that's a really good question. And I would ask you to look at it this way. What can you do to make it as easy as possible for the person who is going to be doing those reference checks? Nine times out of 10, they will ultimately want to speak to the person on the phone. Usually they may send the email first and then they will ask when is a good time to call you. Mm -hmm. So if the person who you're thinking about isn't a phone person, they prefer not to talk, they're better, you know, typing. I, that's something to think about because ultimately they're going to want to talk to your references. Even so, I would say the email and phone number, because though they're going to use both of those. And in some cases, they won't email. They'll just call you. They'll just call. And I've even seen it where they text as well, because the last time someone I know used me as a reference, they actually text me first, which was the first time I said, wow, they text. And then after they text, they call. Yeah, which is nice, because that's one mm -hmm. thing I worry that's about, like just calling someone out of the blue. Of course, mm -hmm. I like to let them know ahead of time, but you know, people don't like to pick up a call with numbers they don't recognize. So. Exactly, exactly. But depending on the person that's doing the references, they they have all different methods, and that's why I say you want to make sure that you're considering all of this before choosing who you select to be your, your reference, because there's nothing worse than someone who doesn't answer the call, the email, the text, nothing, then they're, they're no good for you. <laughs> yeah. 
what are some of like the top three there's you know tips or no no's when involving a resume like whether it's a certain font or color or Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. something like that i love that question because i honestly think that people focus much more on that like the the color of the resume the fonts and i'm not saying those things don't matter because they do but i honestly think that people focus more on the visual aesthetic of the resume versus actually focusing on the content of what's written and what i want to say is what's the most important obviously spelling grammar of course that it, it has to be readable it has to be strong english and you know using the proper periods and punctuations etc but beyond that what the biggest mistake that i believe people make is that when they do their resumes they when they list the job description they will just cut and paste just the duties like the actual duties that they performed in the position some people will even go to google or the internet and cut and paste let's say they were a customer service representative at comcast and so what a person might do is go to comcast find that job description and say hey i'm just going to cut and paste the description that is on comcast that's perfect right and i would say wrong wrong (laughs) wrong here's the truth you have done so much more than just simply what's written in that job description in most cases in the positions that you've had you've had huge impact you've increased sales by 10 or 15 percent you maybe have reduced turnover by 12 percent you have helped the 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 performance rating increase and now you're in a 95 percent percentile you've hired um 12 people and you've managed and grown programs uh your programs have went from a 75 percent uh approval to 90 percent approval so you've had impact you haven't just did a job you haven't just done those things that's listed on the description, but you have increased performance, you've reduced spending, you have helped the department perform much better. And that's the type of language that should be listed on your resume. In other words, when the person is reading your resume, you want them to think because they've hired me, I'm, I've made this job better. And here's how I made it better. Impact, impact, impact. <laughs> and when people just write those this is what I did. That is the biggest mistake you can make, of course, beyond spelling things wrong. That's okay. interesting because I, I always think of what duties that I perform. I never think of like, you know, there's plenty. I like making an impact everywhere I go, but yeah. I just don't talk about that in my, you know, description for that particular job. I just think of these are the things that I correct. So that's Co- a tip. C- correct. So for example, let's say And we can look at this from any possible angle, whether it doesn't matter if it's a corporate position where you're working in a building with a suit. It could be if you work at, you know, McDonald's, it could be custodial maintenance. It could be, you know, whatever type of position that you have, you have specific goals that your supervisor, the certain amount of classrooms that have to be, um, you you know, clean, a certain amount of uh, things that have to be done, you know, um, you know, when you've worked at, let's say, in the fast food, and you know, while working there, you all may have served, went from serving, um, you know, fifty people an hour to serving seventy people an hour. Well, that speaks to impact. Maybe your your customer service has improved. Maybe the efficiency of how you all manage the, the, the stations have improved. And as a result, you're serving more people per hour. That speaks to your impact. Because before you, you all weren't performing that well. And that impacts the numbers, the dollars. And that's what employers want to hear about. They want to hear about what is it about you? If I hire this person, how can I expect them to have an impact on this position we've all had impact we just don't do a good job of explaining it true yeah thank you yeah i know 
this is going to be different depending on the type of job, but say we subtract anybody running for Supreme Court or mm -hmm. astronaut for everybody else, like right. what, what uh, how long is too long for a resume? Now, I love that question. How long is too long for a resume? The truth is there are people out there who's, you know, been in the workforce for 40 years, 30 years and have worked 10, 15 jobs. There are people who have been bouncing around from different positions, getting different experiences. And it's, it, if you were to list all of those positions, the resume could be super long. I'm gonna say this, a resume should be one page, two pages is good. And I would say three pages is the absolute max. I'm more so in the middle of two pages. I think a good length is one to two pages. Three in certain situations, but I would say two is the sweet spot. And here's the reason why. In, number one, employers are looking to see, what's that like what Janet Jackson said, her hit song, what have you done for me lately? Mm -hmm. They're looking to see lately what have you been doing and what what has been your impact and when i say lately we're looking at the past 10 years maybe even the past 15 years and so the things that you've done 20 and 30 and 40 years ago it's not that it isn't important because that actually informs you and your professionalism and it's not that that won't ever come up in the in an interview because it could come up but in terms of the resume they're looking to see in the past 10 15 years what have you been doing so that number one is going to shave down how much needs to be included in the resume because you should be looking at about 10 or 50, I mean, I'll say 10 years. It could be debatable. Some people do a little bit longer, but you should be hovering around that number one. And then number two, we talked about earlier, you want your resume to be reflective of the type of job that you are applying for. So if you've had, let's say 10 jobs and you had some positions in let's say custodial maintenance, and then you had a position where you were doing babysitting, but then you're actually interviewing for a position that's an education, an education assistant position. So the decision you have to make is, does including custodial maintenance and spending a lot of time explaining what I did in that position, will that have any bearing or impact on this education job I'm trying to apply for? Okay. The answer is no, it won't. So while you may need to mention that you worked in that position for two years, you don't have to spend all that time with four and five bullets. You may just need to mention it on your resume and it won't take up a lot of space. But you wanna make sure that the jobs that you are spending time articulating the impact that you've had that those are the ones that's most relevant to the position that you're actually applying for and that you're focusing on the positions that within the past 10 or maybe 15 years. And so if you're following those two um, you know, steps, then you automatically are gonna have a much smaller resume. When it comes to finding someone to help you with your resume, whether it's like an independent company or you know something like that, what do you recommend uh, and what even if you're paying somebody to help you with your resume what is like the max you should pay someone to assist you with your resume that's a great question and what's that old parable that you've heard you pay you you get what you pay for, what you pay for. <laughs> but you know like we don't even have a ballpark range on you know or right and i understand the professionalism of the person that's doing it for you or what are who who are the people that help you with that right again so that that's a really good question but i think it's a few things we have to consider okay where are you professionally are you a person that's maybe you know this is your first job you know coming out of college or are you an executive that's looking to get into or you're looking to get into an executive position 
are you going for a position that you know pays this hundred thousand, two hundred, you know, three hundred thousand dollars salary? So it's so many things to consider. You have to also consider the skill set of the person who's doing your resume, because if I'm going for an executive level position, the person who's doing my resume, they may be better qualified for doing more entry level or mid level resumes. So you have to think about yeah. where am I in my career and this person who's doing my resume, where is their specialty? Because if I personally was helping someone with a resume, I would be less qualified to work on this executive MBA resume where they're going for a position that's probably 300, 400,000. There are certain spaces and realms of expertise that I may not have to help them to the level that they need in order to look the best they can on the resume. So the resume preparer has to know their strengths, their area of expertise. Every resume preparer isn't qualified the same, just like a tax preparer. Right. Some tax preparers can maybe do a, a basic W-2, but someone with all these businesses and all these complicated tax returns, child support, this and the third, they may not be prepared to handle this complex situation. And it's the same with the resume. So I don't think that's a necessarily the easiest question, but I'll say this, I think probably a hundred dollars is the, the probably the baseline you're gonna get, but it could be much more expensive than that as well. But I would say maybe a hundred dollars would be more like the base. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine it being a little more, you know, I just wasn't mm -hmm. too sure. I had no idea really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I've seen a hundred bucks. I think hundred bucks, some hundred and fifty, um, and it it can go higher as well. Yeah, because you're you are paying for expertise and that's yes. what it comes down to, you know. Yeah. Um, and some people need right. more work than others. And some people with what you're going for, you need a lot more expertise uh, because just because you're qualified for a position, it does not mean you know how to convey that on a resume the way that it needs to be. And so we all could be in a position where we need some help and that expertise could be costly depending, especially depending on the type of position that you're you're going for. All right. And it yeah. can be life changing. <laughs> yes. And it could be very well worth the yeah. fee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because sometimes I get repetitive with my descriptions. So, mm -hmm. it's, but it's mm -hmm. hard to think of a different word to describe that. Yeah. You know, so, it, exactly. And there are different techniques as well for that. So, for example, let's say the last three jobs you had, let's say you are a fifth grade teacher. And so you worked at three different schools, but you were a fifth grade teacher in all of those three jobs you've had. Well, so what that means is there's going to be a lot of overlap because it's essentially the same job, just different schools. So there are techniques that can be utilized so that you aren't repeating, uh, but that it's written in such a way that, you know, these three jobs are essentially the same. Um, and so there's just different ways, for example, people, the summary section that oftentimes some resumes have where in the after you do the basic intro, your name, you know, your um, your phone number, your email. Oftentimes people have a summary section where they outline the biggest impact that they've had so that the employer, if they don't see anything else, they could see those major areas. And if you do that, uh, some of that explanation inside of each job may be much smaller because you really spent some time up top dealing with those big impact areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we get through the resume part and interview part and we're at the salary negotiation part. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, so when you're, what are some things that you can negotiate for when you're negotiating salary and benefits and things like that, that a lot of people don't know that you, it is negotiable or I know it's going to depend on the industry and the type of job, but what are right. some things that you notice people don't think to negotiate for when they're first starting a job? Right. Well, the first thing I want to say is negotiations are super important. And oftentimes people end up making less than what they are um, worth 
or they find themselves below where other people in that same industry might be because they don't negotiate their salary. The bottom line is employers expect for you to attempt to negotiate your salary. And in some instances, they may offer you a little bit less because they're expecting that you're going to negotiate. And so when a person doesn't negotiate their salary, they're, they really put themselves in a position that's not ideal. And studies show that minority and women are less likely to negotiate. So that's important because oftentimes when we look at the numbers and we're comparing what groups are making more and less, um, you will find that some groups don't um, negotiate as much. And it, I think it, part of it is because of fear or people don't know how to do it. And so some people are like, well, I don't want to negotiate because if I negotiate, that they may give the job to someone else. I make her break. And that's not quite the case. Employers expect for you to negotiate. And even if they can't offer you anything, even if the position is not negotiable, they aren't going to think that you're a bad employee and just remove the offer simply because they can't give you, um, you know, they can't negotiate the salary. However, when you talk about negotiation, it is important that you do your research first. Because if you're going for a position let's say we talk about a teacher, we need to know how much does a teacher with the, your credentials, a master's degree in education, a teacher who's been working in the field for 10 years, and who's going to be going into a private school versus a public school, or maybe who's going to be teaching in New York versus Detroit. Because guess what, the salaries are different in New York versus Detroit. What an entry level teacher makes is going to be different than what someone with 10 years or one with the bachelor's versus a master's. So in other words, you have to look, first of all, be clear on your experience and your qualifications, because understanding that will help you begin to think about what's reasonable for you to be negotiating in the first place. Secondly, understanding the field that you're in and what's the average amount that they're paying anyway. So for example, if an education position is the average in California, let's say it's 85,000 a year, and I'm making that up, and let's say you go into negotiations and you're trying to get 130, well, that's out of order because what you're asking for is completely above what this position is. So that's why we need to start with some basics first. What exactly your experience is, you know, your education, where, what makes you qualify? Are you beginning, entry, advance in that? That's number one. And then where are you in the country? What is the going rate for people in that state, in that city for this position? That's where you start. And once you have that information, you're in a prime position to do some effective negotiations. That's number one. Now to your question regarding what are some of the things to negotiate, there are so many different things to negotiate. Of course, we oftentimes think about salary, how much you're making per hour, how much you're making per year. We all want to make more money. We, the people, love money, and I'm here for it because the more money I have, the more things that I can buy and the more bills I can pay and I can save. So, of course, that's where our minds go to first. But there's a lot of other things. For example, a mother and young mother and a young father may have a, a baby and child care. Child care is expensive. Imagine working for a company that offers child care. That's a negotiating tool. Or what if they provide working from home? A, a, a father may think that's attractive because instead of getting up an hour early at 5 a.m., he can get the child to school and, and log in because the child only lives around the corner. So that's a benefit versus having to get on a bus and go to the job site that's an hour away. So being able to work from home could be an asset. What if they're offering free insurance? Some people are paying insurance $70 per pay period. Well, there are other jobs where you don't pay for dental or medical. What if your job is offering 6% 401k versus another job that is offering no match? So those benefits that companies offer should be seen as bargaining chips and bargaining tools. But you have to understand what those bargaining chips and tools are. So when an employer is, you know, decides that they think you're a good fit, they're going to determine what they want to offer you. 
Some of them will just call you and offer you the salary. Others will call and offer you a list of the salary and the benefits. So what you want to do is make sure that you're understanding the salary and understanding the benefits. And once you have that information, you can begin to effectively negotiate. You may find that the benefits that you're receiving is satisfactory. And if so, you may not need to negotiate. However, if you have the full picture of what the position will give you, then you may be able to negotiate other things, whether it's time off, whether it's working from home, whether it's different benefits, whether it's education, there may be some opportunities in there that it may not be cash. But I'll tell you this, for a parent, if they get a chance to make $2,000 more on salary or have that child care paid for 70%, I tell you, mathematically speaking, it's better to make that 2000 less and get that child care paid for. So it's not always about the salary. It's also about those other benefits that can make a huge difference as well. Yeah, because there's been times where I've asked for a certain amount and they're like, well, we'll give you a little bit less, but we'll you know, when we add up benefits and mm-hmm. all of these things, it it adds up to what you want. Correct. And correct. Is that just another tactic to kind of negotiate a little bit lower? Or in your opinion, is that you just the person has to decide what's worth it for them and take it? Right. You know, it's you know, it's a matter of perspective. Mm-hmm. Again, the the goal is to make more money so that you have money to cover the areas that matter to you, your livelihood, your child, your education, whatever. But if your employer is offering you a benefit that equates to you spending less than what you would have, then you have to do the math. Again, I work for a company that made me pay $70 for a pay period for my benefits. And then at the next company I worked for, I didn't pay for any benefit at all. That is a huge, even if the salary was exactly the same, the fact that I wasn't paying that 70 or $80 per pay period. Same benefits. Same benefits, but I'm not paying for them anymore. That's huge. So it's just a matter of perspective and understanding. I think that sometimes it may be hard to look at it that way if you just only focus on the salary. For some people, it's really difficult to think about those benefits and really sit there and do the math. But really, by doing so, you could find yourself actually bringing home a lot more when at the at the end of the day once you do all the math. So, in the in the case of like when you want to ask for a raise, I know this is a little bit different than salary mm-hmm. negotiation, but when is, when is it, when is the right time to ask for a raise? How is the right, to, what is the right time or, or the right way to? Yeah. A lot of people just feel that because they've been working at a company for six months or a year, that it's the right time or some people feel that because they found out a coworker makes more than them, then it's the right time. And I would argue that neither of those are good enough reasons to ask for a raise. You simply working at a company for a length of time is not at all impressive for employers to want to offer you a raise. What makes an employer want to offer you a raise is simple that they can see that you have had an impact on the bottom line. You have saved the company. You have brought some efficiency to the company. Your presence has helped the company maintain minimally, but quite frankly, be strong. You have been an asset. And when an employer believes that you in your position has been an asset, then they are interested to discuss giving you a raise and or a promotion. One of my friends was talking to me once and he bought a new home. And I think 
he had exp- it didn't work out quite the way that he wanted to work out so he started spending a lot more money he thought it would be less but i don't know he just still bought the place so he went to his employer and his argument was you know i bought this new home it's costing me more i need more money to pay for my my bills because my bills have increased they don't care that your bills have increased they are not here to concern themselves with your bills they're here to make sure this company is running and if you have helped them and are helping them make the company run better then that will be the reason why they offer you not simply because your bills got higher so it's a matter of us having the right perspective to begin with employers are more likely to offer you a raise when they feel that you quite frankly are worth it your work demonstrates that you are worth it so your best chance of getting a raise is simple doing your job doing it well being a good team player writing down the impact that you're having so that when you do go to your employer and say hey i want to negotiate my raise or negotiate a promotion you can tell them this is what i've done over the past six months this is how i've improved this is the contributions i've made because maybe they've forgotten and once you can lay that out they say oh yeah You've done all that. You're right. You sure have. Let's talk about that promotion because you demonstrate that you're worthy of. That's what's going to get you that promotion or going to put you in the best chance of getting the promotion because the money may not be there. Not all companies have the the, the resources to give you a, a promotion, even if they want to. And maybe they have resources at different times of the year. It may not be the time, but you definitely want to make sure that you consider all that. But before you go in there, make sure that you are asking it for a legitimate reason that they can believe in, not because your cable bill went up by forty dollars and you now you don't have enough money. <laughs> for for some, um, like let's say for people that are getting out of prison or getting out of jail, um, are they able to use like some of the things that some of the maybe skills that they developed in prison through certain types of programs? Are they able to use that? Does that help them when sometimes if when putting it on a resume? And they absolutely, get you know, absolutely. It, it doesn't, you know, you have to really, again, think about what area you're going in, yeah. whether you're a returning citizen or not, and make sure that your resume speaks to uh, your experiences and that it can sell that you will be a good fit for the position. Now, let's be honest, a person that is coming out of a a institution where they've been away, um, they're gonna have a much more difficult time uh, landing a position, it's just the reality. And so we, the best thing for a person in that predicament is to be realistic um, about the industries that may be more likely to work with them in spite that background and really work toward building themselves up. It's not over, it's not the end, but you ju- you definitely have to be mindful that especially coming right out, you may have to crawl before you walk and you may ha- it may take a little bit longer because again, you're you have a a a background that some people may not see as favorable or in some cases their rules say that they can't hire um, certain types of, of people with certain types of backgrounds. So those are those are real barriers that have to be addressed. Um, and that's why a person in that situation, they do have to be realistic. And even for our listeners, we're being open, very open minded. Uh, corporate people go to jail, too. <laughs> oh, 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 absolutely. Anybody can go. Anybody can go to jail. Corporate people go to prison, yeah. too. So yeah. everybody, everybody go to jail because anybody can break a law. Yeah. There is no ex- exceptions yeah. to the rule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in a case where like two people, you find out you have the same experience as another coworker and you guys are both in the same position and you find out maybe he negotiated, he or she negotiated a better salary than you did. How do you how do you deal with that situation? Do you bring it up um, with your employer or like, what do you do about that situation? Right, this is one of those questions. I like this question a whole lot because this is an area where people constantly make mistakes. First and foremost, people aren't supposed to be discussing their salaries with one another. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. So going to an employer and saying, "Hey, I found out that Jane makes the makes a, a fifty thousand more, or twenty thousand, or fifty dollars more, whatever it is, you know, that's already a no no, and I would caution you not to do that, point blank, in all of the period." Because that is going to get you in a circumstance where you are not going to win. Um, and in fact, that behavior is seen as unprofessional and you won't win with that with that method. However, if you do find out that someone that seemingly has the same background as you, it's normal to feel a certain kind of way because you may be thinking, what do they have that I don't? But I wanna give everybody something to consider. There are times when your coworker does more than you or provides a service that you do not provide. Sometimes your coworker could actually be a stronger employee than what you are. And that could be the reason why they make more. It's a tough pill to swallow, but just because we have the same education and the same amount of time working there, that doesn't mean that we're both hard workers that we show the same initiative some people stay longer they they take on extra assignments they don't complain as much they put themselves in the position to be supportive and sometimes it's those reasons why people make more because they may just be seen as a stronger employee and for people who just instantly find out that someone we went to the same school we got they shouldn't make more than me i think that's the wrong way to go about it. Now, there are instances, to be fair, where you don't, they don't do more than you. Maybe you are a stronger employee. Maybe you really should be making more. But that's when it's your job to advocate for yourself and to go to your supervisor and say, hey, um, Jane, I wanted to speak with you about my performance and, you know, about, you know, my position within the company. And then you want to just talk to, you know, your boss and say, hey, I've been here for a year and, you know, I just want to go over my history because these are some of the things I've been able to do. And, um, you know, definitely I want to find out if there's opportunities for me to improve within my position. You find out and then you then you find out, you know, what there if there are any things that they feel that you can do to be a stronger employee. You learn about those things. And then once you've done that, it, then you may go back and say, hey, I want to discuss you know, my, my pay and schedule a, mo a, a meeting with them. But you, again, want to put yourself in a position to demonstrate that you value the company, you value the position, that you're interested in learning, you're willing to do what they've asked you to do. And once you've done those things, you're in a better position to, to negotiate. But I would never, ever advise you to look at what someone else does on the surface and decide that somehow you're being treated um, unfairly because there may be more to it than what meets the eye and you just don't realize it yeah personally i see it they negotiated better or there's something some other reason but i only brought it up because i see i see posts on linkedin sometimes where people feel like we need to be discussing our salaries more because there's a lot of unfairness that goes on out there and just it is it, it is i think that you know in these we're in a world where we have so many startup companies and sometimes the rules in terms of salaries, you can get two people in the same position. They may offer one person 70, another person 140 because they're a startup and kind of the way that they do things, it may not be standardized the way more, you know, other companies may. And so, no, it's not always fair. It's not. I've seen a lot of things that are not fair to be, to be honest, but you have to recognize that if it's a situation where it could be unfair approaching them and telling them hey this is unfair you got to ask yourself what is going to get the better outcome vinegar or honey um what do you need to do to position yourself to be seen in a way that is worthy of that salary and if you have done all those things or if you think it's an unfair work environment then you may decide that you want to go somewhere else because we always have an option to leave. But I just want to caution people not to just go run up in their boss's offices and confronting them, because I, I don't think that that's the way, even if even if there is um, some type of something going on there. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's a better way to approach it is to more yeah. highlight, you know, why you should get more because of everything you've done and the past, right. whatever. Yeah. yeah. I guess um one of I guess a random question. I've spent some time in in I guess the DC area coming from Atlanta to you know DMV even just been out here. It's safe to say that uh, the DMV has a very bad customer service and sometimes you can notice it at the management. <laughs> what are some red flags when applying for a job that you could just say, you know, I don't want to apply for I don't need to apply here. I can see that the management structure and process is this is not going to be a place that I want to work at. Right. Well, every individual has to look at their circumstance and make that determination because some of us are in situations where we need the job and if you need it you need to do what you need to do to you know get the position that's going to help you stabilize your condition that's number one however you are correct there are certain scenarios where it may be um you know obvious that things may not go within the company, the culture may not be something that you're interested in, I'll say it that way. Um, but sometimes it's just hard to make that decision when you're interviewing because the, the people who are interviewing you may not always be a reflection of your supervisor and the team that you're gonna be a part of. Sometimes there may be gaps and snafus in the interview process that may or may not be indicative of the culture and the company you're gonna be a part of. So I would just, you know, I would just consider the big picture and not move too hastily and make a decision that may or may not be the, the best one. But obviously, if you are interviewing with a company where they're not getting back with you, or if there is a lot of rudeness or, you know, I had a friend recently who interviewed with a company and they had him taking the test and they told him that you only have to get three wrong that's the most you can get. But then when he only got two wrong, they came back and said, oh, well, actually, you know, the two wrong that you got, we think those way more. So we're going to have you take the test again. And it was just all this stuff that made no sense. They were kind of reneging on the rules that they put in place. And I said, oh my gosh, if this is how it's happening now, this is the same type of inconsistency and rule breaking that you may experience. And this may not be what you want. So there can be things that make you say, oh, I don't want this. Um, but I do also want to say that it, the interview process may not always be perfect, but it doesn't mean that once you're in a position, it's going to be the same. Um, I would just suggest that a person really evaluate what's happening, evaluate their situation and try to make the best possible position, but don't move too quickly and don't be so quick to assume and, and assume incorrectly. Okay. Yeah, because I've had bad interviewers before. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> Where it's like they just don't know they what don't to ask, know. and I've kind of had to help them yes. <laughs> with the whole interview. <laughs> you, yeah, that can happen. <laughs> just not even, especially in the tech industry, it's like there's a lot of um, yeah. people with social or communication <laughs> issues, and it's like uh, they don't want to do the interview. Yeah. Right. Well, before we get ready to close it out. Don, I, I love talking with you. It's, it's been a great conversation. And I'm definitely Absolutely. You know, looking forward to a third. Absolutely. Know, we're talking about. Um, is there any information you'd like to share with the guests and the listeners to where they can either contact you or, you know? Oh, talk? absolutely. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for having me again. I feel like, you know, we're we're just friends. I mean, your your show, my show, we're friends at this point. Um, and so I just want to say thank you all for for uh, sharing your, your space with me again. Thank you. Thank you. To reach me, I mean, my website is Don Gatewood, D-O-N-G-A-T-E-W-O-O-D dot com. So it's my first name and last name. So that's my website. And there you can find me, of course, you know, um, my podcast is Leadership and Professional Development with Don Gatewood. So you can find me on any podcast or you can come to my website and find me there as well but also just some of the services that i provide the the, the education um the, the the job uh classes and and workshops and seminars that i do that's all on my website so that's the best way to reach me but i'm pretty active all over social media you name it i'm i'm somewhere okay and if you're ever in los angeles again definitely come in for uh, in studio recording 
of course, I was planning on being there, but then my best friend who lives out there, he just relocated to Atlanta. So um, that ruined my California trip. But yes, I'll definitely be out there. I love LA. It's California. The city knows how to party. Eh? That's what uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what Dre and uh, Tupac said. So I believe them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, they yeah. well, thank you to the listeners. Uh, thank you to our viewers. And you can find us at americangypsy.com. We have all the episode audio, videos, information about the guests, um, links to the merch, Consist of Self-Improvement merch at luamli.com. And we also have... We also have some music you can check out under Classic Carpenter, K-L-A-C-C-I-K-C-A-R-P-E-N-T-A. That's on Spotify, iTunes, Tidal, YouTube, all major platforms, some um, cello music, a couple vocal stuff. And also we do the American Gypsy soundtrack where we release instrumentals for our YouTube channel, uh, for our videos for our YouTube channel. And we release those out as a soundtrack. So definitely check out some of that stuff. Thank you again to Don. Thank you to our listeners and viewers, our donators, our supporters, subscribers, everybody. Thank you. Consistent self-improvement to everyone. And peace. peace.